Dr. Lutlot, are you there? Sorry about um, about the delay. Uh, let's just get going. I'll no problem. just make you sorry. I'm making you host, Dr. Lutlotlo. So if I leave early, you don't need to worry. Okay. Hi, welcome everyone. Uh, Prof. Shabi Musa here. We are really pleased to have Dr. Lutlotlo back. Um, to support us in image gap training. Um, and over to you, Dr. Litloto. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Prof. Uh, I'll just put up my slides. Uh, does it, do you only see this light? Uh, no, we see the presentation mode. So if you just switch the mode. See the presentation mode, okay. I think use slideshow. Use slideshow, okay. All right, yeah. so you see that. Okay, well, thank yeah. you for having me um, and good morning, everyone. Um, so this is the second of um, the two trainings that are scheduled for the year. Um, we spoke about mood disorders. I hope everyone got that. And today we are going to talk about psychotic disorders. And just a bit of background, um, which I, I believe everyone is quite aware of. I saw it was also part of the flyers. Um, mental health um, contributes at least, you know, it is part of the three top contributors um, to the global health disease burden, according to the WHO. So obviously today with the, in the mental health um, or in the mental illness um, contribution, we are going to look at psychotic disorders, which contribute but a really small portion um, to the burden. Um, it's of interest that you know, there's, there's three um, disorders are the highest stigmatized illnesses. Um, and you know, so they would lead to um, global you know, um, disabilities and therefore significantly impacting on our socioeconomic factors, which we see in our country. Um, it doesn't help that the greatest burden seems to be observed in low to middle income countries, which involves ours. And so um, the WHO developed this gap action program. And the basis for this is really to avail services um, quite broadly, you know, ease access to services, early screening, um, early intervention, and therefore reduction of morbidity and hopefully mortality. Okay. So the objectives um, at a primary healthcare level for general practitioners is to be able to screen and diagnose any mental illnesses, in this instance, psychotic disorders. Um, um, general practitioners should be able to manage um, these disorders, at least mild to moderate ones, and know when to refer more complex um, problems. Okay. I keep referring to this study because it is the only study of interest which looked at the South African population. And from that study, we were able to appreciate the prevalence of um, the illnesses, the mental illnesses in our country. And as you will see, psychotic disorders, as I have said, contributes less than 1%. And you know, this, this number compares to global figures as well. We do see quite a skewed um, you know, proportion of um, that sample. And hence, we may feel like we see a lot of psychotic disorders, but they're actually not common. But we do know that when we, they do present to us, they present with quite significant challenges. Okay, so what is psychosis? It is characterized by loss of contact with reality. And I think that's the easiest way of explaining it. So psychotic disorders can present with a range of symptoms um, and signs. People may report what we call delusions, and those are fixed beliefs. Um, they may manifest as disturbed speech content, okay? So they say fixed beliefs because even if you interrogate the delusion or the belief that the patient is presenting with, they are not willing to accept any other possible explanation. So when they are persecutory, this is when 
it is quite paranoid. They believe that people may be against either themselves, their loved ones, or their belongings. When, when a delusion is grandiose, um, people may have a very self-inflated sense of themselves that is quite fixed. Um, they may be bizarre, um, which um, are in, really incomprehensible. Hallucinations are really perceptual disturbances. Um, and you know they may be experienced with the eyes or with the ears, and so we will call them visual or auditory. You do get other kinds of hallucinations, but those usually um, form part of ictal clusters. So you may you may get um, um, olfactory hallucinations where people smell things that other people don't smell, gastrotry where, where people taste things that other people do not taste. Usually people that have um, those kind of ictal phenomena should be investigated first for medical illnesses before we attribute those to um, psychiatric illness. So in psychiatry, we know the most common is that of the auditory hallucinations and sometimes the perceptual. People may report disorganized thinking um, in that their flow of speech or their flow of thoughts is not as organized as, as yours and mine may be. And we would be able to assess that when they talk to us and you know, we, we, we find it difficult to follow their speech. So communication will therefore be impaired. People may uh, present or their families may report what we call disorganized behavior. And this will of course be in keeping with the disorganized thinking that is in their heads. So you will see people that are going around picking up um, rubbish, from outside and maybe bringing it into the home and, and, and hoarding it. And some patients may tell you that these are their valuable belongings because at the time, this is what their thought process is. And then we've got quite serious symptoms, which are negative symptoms where people have been, negative symptoms only come on when people have really been sick for a long time. Um, we find that, you know, in that course of illness with the severity comes the reduced expression um, in, in language. So either people present with reduced vocabulary or when people talk face to face, when you're supposed to be engaging with your eyes, I mean, as you would do with your colleagues or anyone, as you talk, you would look at the person that's talking to you. You may use um, hand um, and maybe head nodding, hand gestures. People that have negative symptoms seem to have reduced um, expression. So they may not make eye contact. They don't seem to be engaging with the speaker um, as they should. They present with what we call abolition, which is um, lack of motivation to perform duties that they would otherwise do. So no, no longer motivated to make food, for example, no longer motivated to show up for work. And anhedonia is a general, uh, general loss of interest in activities. Um, and therefore they lack social interaction. So I think, you know, from that we can appreciate that psychosis is a very isolating illness. Um, so psychotic disorders can also present with other mental disorders and that this is really important because you may see psychosis, please pardon and my background noise as a truck passing by. You may see um, psychosis in the context of a mood disorder. So patients have mania um, and psychosis. It's always important to try and ascertain which one started first. We know that as bipolar disorder um, reaches, um, you know, quite significant severity, then patients present with psychotic features. And usually when you treat them, the psychotic features will, will resolve first. Medical conditions. Um, can present with psychotic features. Um, when patients are in their post-ictal um, status, you know, from um, their seizures, they may have some psychosis that may be part of their delirium. Or people with just long-term uncontrolled epilepsy can have a psychotic disorder from the seizures that they continue to have. And then I'm sure, you know, you more than anyone else would have appreciated the psychosis that may present when people are intoxicated in that delirium or um, the psychotic symptoms that they may report when they are in between their drug use, uh, um, their withdrawal periods. Okay, so those are generally, you know, the, the presentations then. I thought to take this because I think this is a nice guidance of just generally how you, 
one should be thinking about making a diagnosis of any psychotic disorder. And I got this from the DSM-5. I mean, this criterion is, um, is a schizophrenia criterion, but you will see that with the rest of the psychotic disorders that I'm going to talk about, they do share the same criterion, just that um, it may range in severity. So you'll find that with people that are schizophrenic, the severity of the symptoms um, is, is a bit higher than um, you know, the, the other psychotic um, disorders. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so generally we look at the presence of, so, so the symptoms might, should be present collect, as a collective and um, at least within the same time period um, for us to get to a psychotic disorder. So this means you can't just have hallucinations and then they go away and have something else, maybe in two years time, they need to be, they need to present as a collective. So uh, patients may present with delusions. Um, um, with or without hallucinations, the disorganized speech and the negative symptoms. And as we've said, um, anyone is anyone may experience any symptoms at any point in time. Um, symptoms that may be distressing, especially as people go through life events. Any symptom becomes pathological when it starts affecting the level of functioning. And when we talk about level of functioning, we look at how that person is functioning. Um, maybe in their social circumstances. So we look at the impact of the psychosis on relationships. You know, if people think that people are trying to harm them, people are trying to hurt them, we find that many a times people have to be brought in by the police because they no longer trust their families. They no longer trust the food that their families are giving them because they believe they may be trying to kill them. So that means the symptom is affecting how this person is getting along with people socially. And then, so you measure across board, how are they getting along with people, with neighbors, with, with people at work? How is the psychosis affecting their cognitive functioning? So in a, in a, in a, in a, in a school going age, you would look at how is the psychosis affecting um, the academics? How is it affecting the work output, okay? Then we get to um, appreciate if, if this is, um, uh, a disorder or a mental illness, okay? For a primary psychotic illness, the disturbance should not be due to another medical condition and it should not be due to the use of substances. Otherwise, the diagnosis changes to, you know, whatever psychotic disorder due to um, either of the two. The disturbance um, should not be attributable um, to another mental illness or disorder. So we always look at what is most likely, just as you would do with medicine, you know, what is most likely. Um, if a patient presents with, with symptoms of mania and psychosis, but also they report some symptoms of depression with psych or psychosis, the most likely diagnosis is that, you know, the patient has had, the, you know, the, the bipolarity, which is the mania and the depression. So you can't diagnose bipolar and diagnose depression at the same time. That's what this means. We will go for the most likely diagnosis. Just a brief run through the psychotic disorders. Um, delusional disorder is quite rare. Um, and this is where patients mainly present with one or more than one delusion, and they don't have any other um, symptoms that we have mentioned. The delusion may go on for over a month, and usually there's a notable stressor that preceded the delusion. And usually with the delusional disorder, we see the presentation much later on in life, after 40, 45 years um, of, of, um, of age. We don't find that there is an impairment in their functioning with delusional disorder. Um, so they manage to function uh, um, except for the area that may be impacted by the delusion. Okay. And then we have what we call a brief psychotic disorder. Um, and this is basically any psychotic symptoms that may go on for a day to a month. What's important about brief psychotic disorder is that the symptoms resolve. Um, um, in less than a month, they do not persist, okay? And patients return to pre-morbid functioning, okay? So there may be disturbance during that period of time, but as soon as the symptoms resolve within um, the 30 days, the patients return to the pre-morbid functioning. 
Again, it is usually preceded by a marked stressor. So there's a, there's a negative life event that would have happened or um, you know, the life event could be uh, postpartum factors. And then we have what we call schizophrenia form disorder, which is a bit of an extension of the brief psychotic disorder. Um, so the symptoms continue for over a month but they remit before they get to the six month period. Okay. Um, and that's what distinguishes it from, from schizophrenia. For the diagnosis of schizophrenia, we need symptoms to be going on for six months. So if they're falling short of that six month mark, we are looking at schizophrenia form disorder. What is important about patients that have this is that um, at least a third of, of them will go into full remission and they will never present to you again with psychotic symptoms. But there is a two third that may continue to develop more serious illnesses, whether that is a schizophrenic um, kind of illness or a schizoaffective disorder. So it is worthwhile when people have had um, a brief psychotic disorder, a schizophrenia form disorder, or a delusional disorder to arrange a follow-up, whether it is in two, three months time, someone needs to see them again because we know that they may actually continue to much more serious um, mental illness. So um, at least this, this highlights, um, you know, um, the profile that should be screened. Okay. And then we look at schizophrenia. Um, and schizoaffective disorder, they share the same criteria. The only difference is that the schizoaffective disorder um, checks two criteria. The criteria for a psychotic disorder, um, as I have stated it from the DSM-5, and the criteria for a mood disorder. So, so the schizoaffective can check the criteria for a major depressive disorder or a bipolar disorder, okay? Otherwise, the psychotic criteria is the same. And then we have the substance-induced psychotic disorder. Um, here, symptoms occur during or very soon after the intoxication or during periods of withdrawal. It is important that that substance um, should be capable of producing the symptoms that you see, okay? Um, so if someone is coming, reporting the use of cannabis, um, if they're reporting um, maybe seeing um, things, maybe um, hearing voices and some persecution, that's quite in keeping with the, the symptoms that may be produced by cannabis, okay? And then we have what we call medication-induced psychotic disorder. Um, again, the symptoms occur during or soon after the medicine intake, and that drug must be capable of producing the symptoms that you see, okay? And then we have psychotic disorder due to another medical condition. So we see that when medical conditions are not uh, fully under control, um, they can um, produce symptoms that mimic um, mental illness. Um, so that they can produce symptoms that are in keeping with a psychotic disorder or symptoms that are in keeping with a mood disorder. Um, particularly of late, I think we see more and more patients with HIV, especially those that are non-compliant, that are not virally suppressed, uh, presenting with a driven, a psychotic drivenness um, from the HIV. So we know that the virus infiltrates very well in the brain and can produce psychotic symptoms. So many more and more, we are seeing people with um, psychotic disorders due to HIV or even with bipolar-like disorders due to HIV. What we, what we know from that is that when we treat, when we treat the, me, the medical illness, so if, if patients become virally suppressed, then the symptoms should remit and there should not be the need to continue with the neuroleptic. Okay. When do you admit people with um, psychotic disorders? Um, I think when patients are not um, contained, when patients present with severe levels of aggression or um, disturbed behavior. So I think for every patient, um, even in medicine, um, we always do a risk analysis for them. We look at the risk to the patient. We look at the risk to the family. 
the risk to the community and the risk to property. If we find that the risk is high on any of these three domains, then that's an indication for an admission. Um, if we don't find the risk, but the patient is, is, is silently psychotic, we don't think they are confronting anyone, they're not hearing voices that tell them to go and confront people, the patient can very well be voluntary, okay? The risk is low. And I think this should always be noted because risk changes as soon as the patient steps out of your clinic. Um, if you find that the risk is high on any of those um, you know, three domains, but the patient is not refusing medication, then the patient should be admitted as an assisted mental health care user under the Mental Health Care Act. If the risk is high and the patient is refusing medication, then it should be an involuntary admission. Okay, so this is against the patient's will, right? Um, important to note that psychosis is often accompanied by a lack of insight into the symptoms. So sometimes, uh, you know, often see people trying to reason with, with psychotic patients, trying to tell them and dispute their symptoms. And unfortunately, that only aggravates the patient. It does not help at all. Their reality testing is impaired and it cannot be corrected by you talking to them. It can only be corrected by neuroleptics. Just like you can't talk someone from a hypertensive crisis into a normal BP. You have to give medication to get into the um, you, you know, to normalize the symptoms. So it is usually only when we have treated the psychosis that the person can look back and realize how sick they actually were, okay? So judgment will be impaired during that time because their reality is completely different from mine and yours reality. And when we talk about the antipsychotics, which is the treatment that we, we give for um, um, any psychotic symptoms or psychotic disorders, um, we have classes of antipsychotics, um, what we call first generation or typical antipsychotics. This is really where, um, where antipsychotics, the, the inception of antipsychotics many years ago. Um, and because of the side effects, um, that have been observed and well studied with the typical antipsychotics. Atypical or second generation antipsychotics have been developed and this promises lesser extrapyramidal side effects. But as we know, no drug goes without side effects. So we have come to appreciate um, the atypical antipsychotic side effects. When you prescribe medication, Obviously, it has to be um, the medication that is available in our essential um, medicines list. Um, but with the challenges that we have been facing in the district, we find that even medication that should be available in the EML is not available. So please, when you prescribe, do always check that your pharmacy where you're working does have this medication. So when we look at typical um, antipsychotics, we look at haloperidol, um, we have had some struggles with the supply of haloperidol, but we generally, you know, mostly have it. We don't struggle with it as we do with all the other medications. So we've got haloperidol, we've got chlorpromazine or lagactyl. Um, and we have the version of haloperidol, which is an IMI um, administration. So we, you know, haloperidol needs to be taken daily orally, but where there are compliance issues, we have got what we call long acting injectables. And this lasts in people's system for at least 28 days. So if someone is not going to take haloperidol or clopromazine orally, we do have an option to just give them what we call um, depot medications, um, you know, clopixol or fluangzo depot and we top up every 28 days. Very convenient, reduces the, the, the pill burden um, and ensures compliance. I put caution here about um, the clopixol IQ phase. Um, I think sometimes there tends to be a bit of a confusion between clopixol and fluangzo depot and clopixol IQ phase. Um, clopixol IQ phase is not um, a long-acting injectable. 
this is the medication that we give to people that are aggressive, uncontained, refusing medication. And we give this medication on an inpatient basis. It's not an outpatient treatment. It only works within 72 hours. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's half life is done after 72 hours. Um, it contains acute behavior. It can cause um, a neuromalignant syndrome and it can cause other extra pyramidal side effects. This is why it should be given as an inpatient where the patient is observed, where blood pressures are, um, are monitored. So please make sure that you, you, you know, you are clear with which one you are prescribing, clopixol depot or fluanzol depot and not clopixol IQ phase. Okay. Then when we look at atypical antipsychotics, we have risperidone. Um, we have struggled with the supply of risperidone and we still continue to. They are just different doses. I mean, some, sometimes you find that um, you don't have, you know, the more higher doses, you have like one milligrams of risperidone. If you have to give the patient six milligrams of risperidone, this means the patient should take six tablets, which increases on the pill burden. And we know that, you know, the nature of the illness, as we, as we said, is quite impaired inside poor judgment. People are not willing to take medication. So if you're going to give them six tablets to take every day, it may be a challenge to get them adherent on that treatment. We've got olanzapine, we've got quetiapine, um, also known as dopoquel or seroquel, and we have clozapine. And I'll go through um, the ones that you will commonly use at your clinic. So when we look at haloperidol, the initial dose can be anything from 0 0.5 milligrams to one milligram. Please do start at lower doses for people that have not had exposure to antipsychotics before. We treat these people as high risk for extra pyramidal side effects. If you are restarting medication on someone that has been exposed to an antipsychotic before and, and there are no reported extra pyramidal side effects, then you can start at higher doses. You could even start at two milligrams. I would rather be safe than sorry. It's easy to top up, usually very difficult to take away what you've already given, okay? So we can increase to five milligrams um, if you see good response on haloperidol, um, then you may um, give the patient the depot medication that we spoke about. Like I said, either the fluanzol depot or the clopixol depot. The challenge, however, with depot medication is that it takes long to reach a therapeutic state. It takes at least three weeks. So if you gave it today, um, the patient will not have um, the antipsychotic effects of this medication up until three weeks from now. So you will need to have your patient on oral haloperidol, which starts working now up until you have reached the steady state of the, of the depot medication. So generally, I would say you start with oral medication for a month. You give um, an, um, a long-acting injectable, your depot medication, and at your month's review, then look at taking away your oral medication and you continue with your depot medication, okay? And you can always assess it, you know, um, I've given a range there like uh, for fluanzol, for example, you can give anything from 10 to 40 milligrams. If you find that there's still ongoing psychotic symptoms, the next dose in, in 28 days, you can increase another 10 milligrams. So you can make it maybe 10 milligrams monthly, 20 milligrams monthly and so on. With the clopixol depot, um, the, the dose ranges are a bit different, but it's, it's still the same, um, same principles as with the fluanzol. With the, with the clopixol depot, you may want to actually start with 100 up to 200. Then you may actually want to start with 100. And sometimes we start with 75 in really small people um, and people that are like 40, 50 kgs. And then fluanzol, with clopixol depot, you increase it with 75 milligrams every time, unlike the 10 milligrams with um, the fluanzol. Okay. If you see um, poor response um, to the typical antipsychotic, or you find that they are poorly tolerated, or you find that the patient is developing extra pyramidal side effects, then please do consider atypical antipsychotics. And please note, I'm not saying that everyone must be started on a typical antipsychotic. 
Patients must be individualized, just like with hypertension, just like with diabetes. You don't always start with one pill. It depends what the patient has and you individualize treatment on the patient. Obviously, if you are dealing with um, an elderly person, someone that, that has a compromised brain, someone that you think is at a higher risk for extra pyramidal side effects, you may want to consider your first line antipsychotic um, and atypical one. So you may want to consider um, risperidone first. If you are initiating antipsychotic treatment in someone that has metabolic risk factors, you may want to initiate them on a typical antipsychotic. I'm just making examples. Okay. So we have oral risperidone. Um, um, you may start at two, I mean, you can go up to six milligrams, not 10. Um, and we have um, olanzapine um, and we have clozapine. Okay. Um, and I've given the ranges um, of medication here, you will increase according to the response that you see. You can generally increase the doses of medication in every one to two weeks. I mean, if you see partial response to any medication in one to two weeks, you can, you can keep increasing. If you don't see partial response, you treat for, at the maximum dose for four to six weeks and you withdraw the drug and you introduce another drug. I'll put clozapine last here because I really discourage its initiation at, um, at a, at a, uh, by a general practitioner and I discourage its um, initiation as an outpatient. We do sometimes try to, to start patients on clozapine from our clinic and we get massive challenges. And, I'll, and this is really because it's difficult to initiate clozapine. It requires a lot of work up. It requires quite intensive monitoring that may not always be possible as an outpatient, okay. Um, so because it causes all of these um, side effects that, that I mentioned on the slides, you need to do baseline investigations so you, you are able to track and document as you continue to increase the doses of the clozapine. So people must have a baseline white cell count um, and um, a neutrophil count because we know that it, 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 it tends to cause neutropenia and acranulocytosis and people may actually become quite um, infected um, with you know, various infections quite easily and become very sick very easily. Um, with, the, with the monitoring of the white cell count and, and the neutrophil count, it needs to be weekly. So this means the patient should keep coming to your clinic. In fact, for the patient, it would mean that they come to the clinic twice. They would come to the clinic every week, one, to take the bloods, two, um, for you to look at the results. So it becomes quite impractical. It's better in a, in a hospital. Um, when the neutrophil count drops to below one, clozapine must be withdrawn. It can cause myocarditis. Um, so a baseline ECG is important and constant monitoring um, for blood pressure, temperature um, are also important. At higher doses, we tend to see clozapine um, um, increase the, the, the seizure threshold. So when we get to higher doses, we tend to give prophylactic um, antileptic. It is nasty and notorious uh, for causing um, constipation. Um, and if constipation continues, unfortunately, we have seen presentations of ileus and patients requiring abdominal surgery. Um, and of course, the metabolic risk factors, which are shared by um, all of the atypical antipsychotics. So all the atypical or second generation antipsychotics we see cause blood pressure changes. They tend to work on the alpha receptor. So we see postural hypotension, but with longer um, exposure to treatment, we actually see them developing hypertension. Um, they get glucose intolerance, um, and many a times it actually becomes quite difficult to treat them with oral hypoglycemics. Um, the atypical antipsychotics also cause quite significantly increased body max index. Let me tell you, some of the patients that would be admitted in a hospital for, say, a month, 
on olanzapine may leave the hospital a month later, five to 10 kilometers, five to 10 um, um, kilograms heavier. So it's significant and it increases the, the waist circumference. It causes dyslipidemia, especially increasing of the triglycerides, which really becomes tricky in, in, in our setting where we do not, I mean, we only have Zoco, simvastatin, we don't have the fibrates. And we know that Zoco, um, I don't know if it actually has any, any effect on the triglycerides and on the lipids. Um, and we know that it's very expensive to buy fibrates. Um, so that's, that's something that needs to be monitored. Um, you would, of course, treat um, all these risk factors as you would according to your STG. Um, and I have made reference to where you can find that information on how you can manage it. And most importantly, atypical antipsychotics are associated with arrhythmias. They either tend, they, they prolong in either QT intervals, they may, they may cause changes in your T waves, um, you know, inverted um, in P waves. So again, baseline ECG and monitoring generally of these things, at least biannually. Okay. Typical antipsychotics, notorious for their extrapyramidal side effects. Um, and these three are quite common. You know, dystonia is an involuntary pulling of a group of muscles. So you may find that it affects posture. Um, these kinesias are generally, um, it, it can be quite restlessness or involuntary tremor that appears as restlessness. I think what we quite commonly see is um, a tardive um, tard dyskinesia. Um, and this is usually facial where patients may have asymmetrical um, tremor um, or involuntary movements of their faces. And then we see Parkinsonism. I mean, the symptoms are exactly the same as you, you, you would get in Parkinsonian disease. Um, we find that the gait um, is slowed, shuffling, there's a reduction of expressions, quite bland and flat effect. And they also have that asymmetrical tremor at rest. Okay, so how do we treat this? With dyskinesias, and, and I, I think it's very difficult to diagnose dyskinesia, especially if you have not seen it. So please, if you're not sure about the extra pyramidal side effect that you are looking at, please do ask for advice, call a colleague. Because if you give anticholinergic to a dyskinesia, unfortunately, it makes it worse and it becomes very difficult to reverse it. Otherwise, with Parkinsonism and with dystonia, we know they respond quite well to anticholinergics. We have ophenadrine. Um, you may start at 50 milligrams daily, depending on your response. You, you may take it to 50 milligrams TDS. Um, um, and this should be for um, a few weeks. It should not be indefinite treatment. Okay. Um, and of course, anticholinergics should be used with caution in the elderly um, because of their side effects, I think, especially so the urinary retention, the hypotension, and they may cause confusion. Benzodiazepines may also help, especially with dystonia. They may, they may cause, you know, they may help with relaxing um, the muscles. Um, consider treatment review, really. Um, consider reducing the treatment. If you're still not, um, you know, you're still not getting um, an improvement of this extra pyramidal side effect, consider referring the patient. You know, this, this extra pyramidal side e e effects are very uncomfortable for patients and they're actually very painful. Um, imagine your group of muscles pulling to one side um, and not being able to correct that pulling. It's very stressful. Patients may actually stop taking your treatment because of that alone. So I wouldn't hesitate to refer if I found, I found it difficult um, to manage them. Okay. Thank you. Um, I will take questions. I try to keep it very short. I hope um, we at least have some idea on how to approach, diagnose and manage, um, you know, the, the common at least psychotic illnesses that I have mentioned. I'm not sure if Prof is still here, but I saw a hand that was up. OK. 
Okay, I suppose Prof is not here. And if I'm correct, I don't see any questions. So let me just check here. Okay, thank you then. Um, I believe Prof will make the recording available to anyone who is interested in having it. Um, thank you, we are done.